All right. Everybody, good to see you guys. Welcome. If you would turn your Bibles to First Chronicles chapter 28, it's where we find ourselves this evening. So, uh, St. Patrick's Day, it's funny, it has nothing to do with leprechauns, it really has nothing to do with uh, going out partying, it has uh, nothing to do with green, it really has nothing to do with the Irish either, does it? Go ahead and just grab them. Nothing to do with the Irish either. <laughs> well, I guess it does, but um, you know, it's just always good to look these things up because it actually is a, you know, uh, speaking of... Patrick, who evangelized the Irish from England, uh, is a great story. So if you don't know much about, I say it very loosely, St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great thing to know and learn and to, to, to understand because it's a great history. It, it should be like uh, Missionary Day, you know. Uh, that's what it really should be. And I don't know how somehow it got to being green and leprechauns and Irish and drinking an excuse to go out partying or whatever, turning rivers green in Chicago, whatever nonsense they, <laughs> they kind of do. Uh, and really, uh, anyway, I think it's a great story. So if you don't know much about Patrick who evangelized the Isle of Ireland, um, it's a good one to know and learn. So that's really the, the true history of, of uh, the man and the great work that he did, bringing the gospel there. So I say that only because, you know, table, St. Patrick's Day has just got so lost on so much. Um, but it's a great, great, great uh, encouraging story. All right, um, yeah, there's a lot of folklore around it, a lot of craziness around it, but when you read the real story, it's, it's a great encouragement. All right, well, we are in First Chronicles chapter 28, and um, let's go before the Lord in prayer, and then we'll pick it up in verse 1 there. Father, um, tonight as we gather, Lord, we, we do rejoice in the great work that, um, that Patrick did. You sent them out, Lord, to share the good news and... Um, and the great impact that it had really on that, that island. Um, just great things that you did in and through his life, uh, life-changing things, uh, amazing stories we'll hear in eternity uh, about the great work that you did through this man and others like him, Father. And so we, we rejoice in not in an excuse to do different things or you know, wearing green or pinching people or any of the other kind of stuff, Lord, but in the great work that you uh, have done and are doing and will continue to do, Lord. And so we rejoice in that. And tonight now as we uh, turn to your word, Lord, we ask that you would just continue to minister to our hearts, Lord. Help us to put aside the distractions of the day, Lord, that we might uh, focus on uh, what you would say to us tonight, Father, because we know you want to speak to us. And so we ask that you'd move by your spirit in our hearts and in our midst. And for we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was going to try to finish the last two chapters of First Chronicles. Uh, that was kind of my intention originally, but you know, there's just a, a, a enough. I think rather than try to make it one long study, um, I think it's better if we do two shorter uh, studies. I, I think it's great just to focus on it's the last words really of David and the last actions of King David. And I'm not sure when we'll visit him again. I mean, literally, we have a lot of books in the Old Testament if the Lord tarries to go through before we get back into reading about David and Samuel. Um, but, you know, we looked at him in, in, in you know, First and Second Samuel, more closer to the end of that. But uh, And then Kings a little bit, and then, of course, in Chronicles again. And so, um, you know, we're really not going to visit his last words or his life much Um really and for quite a bit so i thought you know what let's just take it a little slower and look at these last two chapters um it's his swan song if you would those final words again of encouragement to the people to his family to his son, one of his sons specifically solomon 
uh, you know, it's just his final, what's important at your end of your life uh, kind of words. And so um, we're going to kind of look at those in these, these next uh, two weeks and then we'll move on and move into Solomon's and Second Chronicles. But the last time we, we left off last week was with David making preparation for the temple. Uh, the workers, mostly it's workers, uh, which would be the Levites. Uh, and, you know, some of the Levites, of course, again, are priests. Some of their, what they were going to do. And then a, he also talked about uh, some of the judges, people that would help rule on matters of dispute. And also, you know, part of the things the judges were to do were to also share, you know, what God's plan, uh, what the Word of God said, God's heart on matters. And so uh, we talked about that. Um, you know, on those four chapters, or actually five chapters last time. And now, as I said, chapters 28 and 29 are really the last words and works uh, of David. And, you know, I, I don't know if this was the last matter of weeks, or if this was the last matter of days uh, in his life, or maybe even over a period of a little less or a little bit more um, in that time. But we'll see what's really important in the last recorded uh, words of David in actions. Uh, what's really important at the end of his life, what he's really focused on and what his heart is. And so, um, again, I think one thing we'll see it's absent of is, you know, a list of regrets, but a, rather a lot of words of encouragement and exhortation. And so let's look at verse 1 of First Chronicles chapter 28, and it says, Now David assembled at Jerusalem all the elders of Israel, the officers of the tribes and the captains over the, of the divisions who served the king, the captains over thousands, the captain over hundreds, and the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king and of his sons, with the officials, the valiant men, and all the mighty men of valor." So uh, I think here it's it, David is gathering everybody. Uh, the who's who of the nation would be there from, you know, all those that represented the leadership of all the nation, the different groups of people or tribes that represented throughout the whole area under his rule. Uh, all those people came there. All the military people of note were there. Those that were in his government, we would say today, all those serving in, in the palace and serving around his sons and all those advisors and, you know, I, you know all the, the, the Levites of important and probably the priests, uh, all those officials, those men that had probably been with him in the cave those days uh, when he was running from Saul in those different caves, uh, all those mighty men that we have talked about over the weeks here, all those guys are are gathered together and so I imagine a number of the people are there as well but he's just he's gathering everybody there together to giving out his final words of encouragement and instruction he wants everybody to 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 hear that um, it's 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 something that was done well done throughout times really throughout all the work of God I mean I could think of um, you know, just off the top, you know, Jacob, he gathered all his, his children around and I'm, their wives and imagine their grandchildren, his grandchildren were all around and he made some parting comments at the end of uh, Genesis, you know, chapters 48 and 49, that where he gathered everybody around. Moses did that. That's really what the whole book of Deuteronomy is. Um, on down the list, David's doing it here. You know, I believe Paul did that as much as he could when you read the letter of second timothy you know he was kind of gathering hey timothy grab this do this get those guys come over here let's you know as, as many as would come to rome uh and of course they're risking their their lives uh those but you know trying to gather them together with some final words as well and so just wanted to give everybody that he could those uh final words I think it's a great thing to do. Just remind those that you love and what the Lord has shown you, what the Lord has put on your heart. Um, and so he's going to do all that. And I think it's always great um, to start now. You know, remind those that are close to you, those that, 
you know, you're ministering alongside those that are family, that they might know your heart. It's just not like some last thing when you're on some deathbed somewhere. It, good to repeat it then, but I think it also needs to be established even before that. I, I think it's a good time to do that, that, you know, those closest to you would know your heart of how to carry on in this particular area, whether it's, you know, ministries at church or your family at home or your children, grandchildren, all that. It's always good to to do all that, to remind them, to encourage them, to stick with the things of the Lord and what the Lord has for them, what the Lord has showed you. Um, it's, it's important to do that. And um, that's what's going on here, if you would, in these last two chapters. And then it says in verse 2, Then King David rose to his feet and said, and, and I only stopped there for a second, is because, again, we know David was pretty old and we were reading through uh, Second Samuel, we know that you know he was he couldn't even get warm. We know he died at seventy, um, but you know he had, he he was getting pretty fa- frail, and you know the guy had lived a pretty difficult, hard life. Now, seventy wasn't super old. Um, people think, wow, in those days seventy was old. Not really accurate. What what made lifespan shorter back in those days, or even a hundred years ago, or two hundred years ago in, in our own nation was the average in of infant mortality, right? So a baby dies a few days old or a few weeks old or a few months old, and then somebody dies old, that you know, you average those lifespans out and it really shrinks them down, right? So people live to 70 and 80 and older and so forth. Um, uh, maybe not as often as today, but you know, what really skews that number is, is infant mortality. Um, and but David, you know, lived a hard life. He, you know, fought Goliath when he was a teenager and pretty much from that point on was a, 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 a soldier and a warrior, you know. Um, even when he was older, running from his son Absalom. Remember that whole thing going on and they had to deal with all that. So, again, you know, probably uh, <laughs> kind of hard on the, on the body there. But he's about 70 and he's, he's able to stand to his feet. So he's making an effort, I think, uh, here at the end, uh, even though he's pretty frail at this point. And so he rose to his feet and he said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and made preparations to build it. But God said to me, You shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war and have shed blood. However, the Lord God of Israel chose me above all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he has chosen Judah to be the ruler. And of the house of Judah, the house of my father. And among the sons of my father, he was pleased with me to make me king over all Israel. So David stands up and, you know, first thing he says was, you know, the Lord put it in my heart. Uh, 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 He had it in my heart originally, uh, obviously, and the Lord put it in his heart, as we'll see in a little bit here, to build this um, resting place for the Ark of the Covenant, which we would know as the temple. And I just uh, want to just remember, and we'll look through that a little bit tonight here, but remember that was one of the uh, uh, seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple there in Jerusalem, the one that Solomon had built. It was, a, it was a magnificent, it was marvelous, it was very expensive, um, it was ornate. We'll look at some of that tonight, we'll look at even more of it next week. Uh, and we've even talked about it in weeks past, and of course in other studies as well. I mean, it was very expensive, and we'll see the gold on top of jewels, on top of uh, precious metals, everywhere you could put precious metals. So insanely expensive, even by today's standard, but I want you to know how David refers to it. Yes, this is the place where the ark is going to rest, which was the presence of God, but he also puts, if you notice at the end of uh, verse 2 there, that it's really nothing more in the in in relation to God as something you would put your feet on, <laughs> a footstool, right? 
I mean, something that you put your feet on isn't usually considered anything of too much value or else you wouldn't put your feet on it, right? I mean, you don't uh, put your feet up on something nice. You don't put your feet up on, on anything that you care about, particularly uh, if you go back not too much in our past where there wasn't any paved roads or streets or asphalt or cement roads at all and and maybe you know there'd be some boards on the ground and maybe some cobblestone some few hundred or so years ago but even before that pretty much you know uh for a lot of point it, everything was dirty and muddy so your feet particularly in david's day would just be absolutely dirty they didn't have high tops uh, covered shoes uh, that much um, you know it was cheaper and easier for most people to have sandals you know you could slip them on take them off but it's just cheaper to you know not to build the soles and all the constructions we have today of making shoes you know weren't so so well known or so well available back in that day so your feet were well, were pretty nasty they're the dirtiest part of your body certainly and so something that you know in relation that's really just in 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 comparing to who the Lord is, even though this is probably the most expensive building built, certainly in that time, and certainly for, I don't, I don't want to compare it, but certainly up there of all time, okay? Um, you know, in, in God's estimate, it's something you put your feet on, right? I just like that, because in comparison with God, it, it's, it's just something you put your feet up on, Right? And I, and I like that about that. He understood that as, as, majest, as majestic and expensive it is in our eyes. Well, when you put it in relation to the Lord, n- not so much. And again, David, you know, states to the people what we've talked about. It was clear that David um, couldn't build the temple because he had fought many wars. Now, David wasn't sinful or unjust. They're not mentioning any of those war things about being uh, wrong or sinful or unjust, but it was the representation of that. You know, David spread out the nation uh, to borders where God had promised getting closer to what God had promised way back in Genesis with Abraham and passed that along to his, his sons and so forth. Um, and so, you know, a lot of those nations we've read uh, uh, attacked Israel, David, uh, you know, defended and was victorious. But um, again, the representation was, you know, no, no, it's going to be built in a time of peace. I I want the world, the rest of the world to know, you know, that I'm just not um, like a lot of leaders and nations were these big warmongers that were out conquering and Alexander, name any of the the generals or Caesars that ruled Rome, uh, uh, the Persian Empire, you go back before that, you go after that, you know, these conquerors making big things for themselves and big majestic palaces and all this. No, no, Lord, listen, Solomon means peace, like shalom. You get hear the word through there, right? Um, and, and it's just uh, peace. I want, I want, you know, the rest of the world to know uh, this is not some conquering thing that I need to put my thumb down on the rest of the world. No, no, I, I, I'm, I want them to truly know who I am. So I want Solomon to build that. And uh, so he, he states that to the people and in verse four says, you know, um, but I also know, um, however, that I was chosen by the Lord. I have my calling and I have my purpose. You know, I was chosen, you know, this group was chosen, Judah, and then, you know, my father's house, and I was chosen out of my father's house, and, uh, you know, the Lord made me king. And so, yes, that wasn't to be what the Lord called me to do as far as building the temple, but I did have my calling and my purpose from the Lord. And I might stop just to ask you to reflect as well tonight. We also have our own place and plan of our lords as well in our lives and i'd like you to think for a second let's just kind of reflect in your own mind could you state it like david stated it here i mean if somebody were to say to you you know what's 
God's plan and what's God's calling in your life. And that doesn't mean that it'll change a little bit here or change there or change, you know, it might change. And, you know, um, you know, sometimes we use that as well. I don't know. I know this. I know that, you know, um, I, I think though that's true and the Lord could um, move our ministry or change this about us or change circumstance that way, you know, at least at this very present, at this very moment, I think it's good that we all could be able to say that pretty clearly and pretty concisely in our own minds. I think that's a good thing because you do have a calling and he does have a, a purpose for your life. And uh, we should know that and we should be able to express that to others. And if it's not clear to you, then it's something good to ask. Now, you might have this one gift that he gives to you the rest of the years he has you service. He might add to that. He might give you another one and, and set that one aside for something else. But at your current spot, at any point in your life, we should be able to know that I have a calling and a purpose and not in some fuzzy, vague way. Well, I know there's a calling. I know there's a purpose. You know, um, uh, uh, you know, I know what First Peter 2, 9 says, and I just put it up there. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so, yes, we've been called that and we do have a calling and we are separated unto him and we are a holy nation and we know those things in a general sense and those are very true and those are very good and we should know that. But we should also know, again, what he has for me you know, now and what my calling is and what my purpose is. And if it's not clear, Lord, I ask you to make it clear. Because he called you out of your family, out of your city, out of all you know to be his own. We can say that with surety. He called me out of this, you know, and, and a lot of us, he called me out of my family. I'm the only one, or I'm, you know, maybe one of a, a couple are here. I, and he called me out of that city I grew up in or that place. You know, he called me out of what I would have known and what I would have done and where I would have been to be his own. So I know he's done those things. So I know there's a calling and I know there's a purpose and I, and I want to know that. It's, um, um, Ethan and I, maybe Annabelle and I, I can't remember who we were talking the other day about a mission statement. Was that you, Ethan? Was that you, babe? Missions? Was it you? Okay, Ethan, I can't remember. You know, we were talking about some business something the dentist's office or something maybe or something anyway it was a mission statement and i was kind of explaining to ethan you know, a lot of business will have a mission statement and the idea that businesses are encouraged to do a mission statement and even churches do them in other places and, and, and there's some really good things to it because it's anybody whether they're in the company or outside the company in in a matter of a sentence or two uh, you know something brief would know like this is what that company is all about you know, this is, this is their purpose, this is what they're trying to get across to you. And those are good. You know, it takes a while to come up with that. But I think, you know, uh, moving out of that context, moving that into our, our own hearts and lives, I think we should do that. And we should, that should be known or it should be made clear to us or we should desire to make it clear and not some vague, well, I know I'm his, I know he's got something, I know he gives gifts and I, I know these things, but no, no, what about you specifically? And it's good to know that because um, uh, David knew this and he was clear on it and he was inspired by that. See, if you know it and it's clear to you, it will inspire you to continue to, you know, serve him and, 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 and answer that call and to make more sure that purpose and making sure that's going to pass. It, it's a great inspiration. It was a great inspiration to David to know that. And it's a great inspiration for us as well. Uh, and um, again, because I know this fact, David, to say, because I was used in a special way, uh, I know that you will be excited for God's will working in and through your life as well. 
and uh, a, a great motivator and a great inspiration to, to know all that and to be able to say that. And when people hear you say that and know that with clarity and certainty, uh, and it should be that way. Uh, it's not a matter of pride. Well, this, this, no, no, it's just a matter of certainty and clarity. And, uh, you know, our Heavenly Father has free reign to make edits and changes as He sees fit. But for right now, this is what I know. And if He chooses to, you know, add this or move, He has all, all rights of editing here. But this is what I know it is today. And it'll just excite you and it will inspire others when we share that with people that the Lord brings our way as well. And, and, and David's doing that, not a matter of boast, but a matter of inspiration and a, a matter of clarity, which I think our Heavenly Father wants us to have as well. Well, verse 5 goes on to say, And of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And now he said to me, it is your son Solomon who shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son and I will be his father. And so now David, again, sure of his calling and what he's done in his life and then what he's doing now through Solomon. He's He's addressing that not only to Solomon, but to everybody else who's listening there. I know, Lord, chose Solomon to be the ne next king. And, uh, you know, there was some debate about that. And obviously one of his uh, Solomon's older brother wanted to do it. There was some um, intrigue in the court. There was some, I don't know if it was so much open rebellion. Maybe they thought that's just the way things should go. I, I, I don't know. There's a couple of schools of thought on that. But... Obviously, there was a group of people who thought, you know, it should go another way. But no, he's making it very clear again. No, this is Solomon. It's God's will. He is supposed to take over next. And I know he's supposed to build the temple. And so, I imagine Solomon sitting there, and again, a teenager at this point, probably, you know, Ethan's age, 16 years old or somewhere around that, that, that age or so, a little bit younger, a little bit older or something around that point to hear of his dad's assurity of, uh, of his calling and his purpose in the Lord. And then knowing that the Lord told him that, hey, Solomon, uh, you know, this is your calling and this is your purpose right now. You're to be king and you're to build the temple. So you got right out of the chute now here. You got a calling and a purpose from God. You, you need to, you need to, you know, rule and get that going. And you need to build a temple because that's also God's plan for him. And so he was encouraging not only Solomon, but then all those others of thousands of people around there, I believe, that would hear that, know it's God's will, and that would encourage Solomon to be faithful in that calling. And I th again, I think when we express that and when we share that and when we're sure of those things others can be an encouragement to us when we go through seasons of difficulty or trial or unsurety you know that uh, you know we'll remember what the lord's calling is remember what you said remember what happened remember these circumstances and so we can too encourage those we know um, in what the will of the lord is and the purpose is for them it's a great thing. And if people aren't sure, and they're a little timid, maybe a little frail in those things, and they you know, they know enough about the Lord where they should be stepping out more, but they're not, or they're, they, you know, they've been around long enough and been a part of church and the body of Christ where they should be growing and they don't seem to be. They're allowing things of the world to kind of distract them. Not that they're falling headlong into sin or anything, but, you know, distract them or, or whether they're just not really stepping up because they're a little afraid or unsure. You know, this is a great thing to, to step in and remind them, hey, listen, the Lord's got a calling on you. He's got a purpose in your life. What is it? <laughs> And, and you should know it and then, and then do it. It's a great thing. It's a great thing to do to encourage those that are maybe in those situations of unsurety or living in some sort of, you know, vague 
idea of the whole situation. And, and that's not what the Lord wants, nor the encouragement here. And again, one of the greatest things that David is reminding, again, his son, and we can remind others, is that you're chosen by the Lord. You know, you're, you're chosen. Um, you're chosen, you're chosen. I just can't help but to ring that bell a few times. We're chosen by the Father. You know, He's chosen us. Uh, uh, encourage others. You can do it. Everything's going to work out. Remember, you're called. God's chosen you. Great words of encouragement during difficult days in people's life or discouraging days in people's life. You're chosen. If I'm chosen and he's got a plan, then he's going to work everything out according to plan. Doesn't everybody want to hear that, especially in a, in a, in a dark hour or an uncertain hour? As this might be, a great, godly, experienced, older king, some teenager taking over. Oh, man, talk about a lot of people probably being uncertain about that, right? Well, there's a lot older sons he has who have been around and have experienced and it seemed like they would be the the wiser choice to make yes maybe in according to man's logic and maybe there's even some logic here but no no this is this is chosen by the father this is his will and so we embrace that what a great thing that david's doing here for everybody that's listening even to this day well, he continues in verse 7, Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever if he is steadfast to observe my commandments and my judgment as it is this day. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the assembly of the Lord, and in the hearing of our God, be careful to seek out all the commandments of the Lord your God that you may possess this good land and leave it as an inheritance for your children after you forever. So I imagine now, as David's saying that in general and all those things we talked about, and, and, and I imagine him kind of looking over at Solomon, who's maybe right next to him, right below him, or somewhere right there. He says, you know what? Uh, and son, stay faithful. Stay faithful in, in the Lord's commands and what he's calling you to do. And I'm saying that in front of everybody, you know, everybody else needs to hear that and know that as well um, to, to do that. Because if we do that, things will go well. Now, remember this. In the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, if you would, you know, the promises made to the nation, particularly about the land and being in the land, were conditional. If you do this, then the Lord will do that. And David is just repeating that, what the Lord told him way back with Nathan and the prophet and, and, and other circumstances that it's been recorded throughout the Old Testament here. He's, you know, reminding uh, Solomon the same thing that he knew as well, right? Listen, uh, uh, and it's going to be repeated to all the succeeding kings, by the way, as well which was told way back, you know, uh, in the law of Moses, that the land was unconditionally theirs, but whether they lived in it or not was a condition. <laughs> you know, was not part of that uh, unconditional. The land was always theirs. God gave it to them. But whether they were able to occupy that, that was a different story. And the condition was pretty simple, if we can sum it up. Seek the will of the Lord and you'll get to stay in the land. Do what he's called you to do. Lead as you're called to lead. Live as you're called to live. And then you will stay in the land. And if you do that, then you will be blessed. But not only that, those who follow along after you will be blessed because of the example that you set for them. That would encourage them to do the same thing. And then they would be blessed. And the idea was for they would set the example in them for the generation after that. And then they would be blessed because of what their fathers did and because of their faithfulness now and on and on it was supposed to go. And clearly in the old covenant, you know, obedience would be followed by material blessing. Just God made a lot of promises that if you're obedient, there would be many material blessings for them. And, and um, 
physical blessings, you know, long life, uh, good health, no sicknesses. There was all those physical, material type blessings. Uh, yes, they, there was a, a lot of uh, promises based on that. Obedience would bring blessing and the material and physical in that sense. But you might say, Dylan, we're not living in the Old Covenant and the Old Testament times. No, we're not. We're living in the New Testament days. And our covenant is different. Uh, I'll throw up Ephesians. Uh, I'll display. Throw up is probably not a... <laughs> it can be misdrewed there. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Praise the Lord. Uh, praise be to uh, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And I think that that just shows us here. Uh, the new covenant, uh, our promises, uh, the blessings that I should say we receive for being faithful have to do with, with spiritual blessings. And, and they include more than that. It's not just limited to that. The Lord certainly blesses us physically and materially as well. That certainly is true. But primarily, we always need to understand that, that really God promises to us is spiritual blessing. And that's how people get confused and go off on this prosperity kind of stuff. You know, if you give $100, God's going to bless you with 1000 If you do this, you know, in faith, he's going to do that. And it, you, you kind of switch back that kind of way of thinking. And people think that way today, uh, by the way. It's not just in those kind of, uh, you know, type of church settings. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people in the Catholic Church today would say the same thing. You know, they, would, they, they kind of have this thinking, and I'm speaking in general terms. Not everybody, don't be offended by that. But in my experience, in our community... You know, it's like, well, if I do these things, you know, then I expect God to do these things. And uh, there's a lot of people that are caught in not just Catholicism, but in, uh, you know, Protestantism that have this, you know, understanding in their own mind that if I do these certain things, I expect God to do these certain things. And sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. But let me just remind us primarily the promises we have are spiritual blessings. God's not some kind of good luck charm, you know, that we carry in our pocket or some lamp that we read, uh, that we rub, I'm sorry, or some, you know, uh, I scratch your back, you scratch my back kind of thing. Quick pro pro clo, quick pro clo, pro pa, pa, easy for me to say, but you understand, expedient, you know, I do this for that. Um, it's it's not like that. He's ultimately always worried about our spiritual uh, and eternal being. And so that's what his promises is, are for us. And of course, you know, uh, he, he does bless us in many other ways as well. But when we read these things, we can kind of get a little confused by it. And I just kind of want to make that clear. That was some of the conditions that the Lord put uh, on particularly when he gave the law to Moses into the promised land and how long they could stay and how they could stay and what would cause them not to, you know, not to be able to possess the land or at least for a period of time. And um, so we have it there. And then, you know, David understands that, hey, you know what? At the end of the day, really at the end of the day, you know, just obedience uh, was important no matter what the covenant is, right? You know, God called us to to follow what he's called us to follow. And so it's important that we continue to do that. David understood that. We understand that today. And so he was encouraging in that and reminding him of that, that this is the consequence. Man, if you want to bless your family that comes after you, then you keep doing it. I try to do it. You try to do it. Keep going. Keep hanging in there. Keep going forward. And then he says this in verse 9, and this is kind of one of those ones I think it's good to circle in your mind, if nothing else, and looking at. But as for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father. I just want to stop there for a second. I like this about David, and I think this is one of those great things that make David a man after his own heart. Uh, 
know the Lord the way I do, Solomon. Know the Lord the way I do. You see how much I love the Lord? You see how much I, I, my love and my heart for him? Solomon, do the same. Now, you might be thinking, that sounds like a tall order for a parent to say. Um, and, and, and those that we set example over. So not, just, not, not limited to just parents, but to those that we set an example for. And that could be in many ways, younger believers that can be older than us, younger children, but whoever we, you know, whoever the Lord has set us an example over, but particularly children, because we're talking about a father and a son here, but it's true uh, farther than that. It, it seems like a little bit something out of place in one sense, because, well, David wasn't perfect, <laughs> right? As a matter of fact, we know where David blew it with, with great detail. We know how David blew it. And yet, it didn't cause him to back away to say it. And that's what I respect. You know what? He could have said, you know, follow me and I do it most of the time and, you know, look at the good and kind of toss out the bad. Okay, not necessarily a bad thing to say, but he doesn't even go there. Because, you know, David knew at the end of the day, no matter how many times he messed up, and he did, he was in love with our Heavenly Father. And he wanted Solomon to experience that love too. And it, there wasn't any qualifying statements like, but you know, I know I messed up over here, and I should have been a better dad to Absalom, and I should have done this, and I shouldn't have done that, and I could have done this with the Philistines. And, you know, there, I'm sure there was a huge laundry list like in all, uh, all of our lives, but he doesn't even go there. And it just seems like such a tall order for a parent because we just know our frailties. They're so clear to us, but yet that doesn't back him down a little bit. And I like that. And I think we should have that heart as well. You know, at the end of the day, when the rubber meets the road, uh, you know, we just love the Lord and we want our children to know that love and to have that same kind of love as well. What, what a great thing to say and not have to put a bunch of qualifiers on, well, except for this and that. and what, No, no, I just want you to do that. And I like that. And serve him with a loyal heart, it goes on to say, and with a willing mind. I think that's the key there. For the Lord searches all the hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Listen, just know this. I think it's pretty clear and it's pretty cool here that, you know, David said, listen, you know, I, I want you to love the Lord and I, I, I want you, him to be yours like, like he is in my life and special. And I want you to know that, you know, it, it, it's, it takes a loyal heart and a willing mind. And even in the Old Testament, even in the Old Covenant, the Lord desires from His people a loyal heart and a willing mind. It's not complicated. That is what He's always desired in and from us, and that is an inward condition, isn't it? I mean, a loyal heart and a willing mind is really a, 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 an inward condition. How do I know that? Because it says, you know, he says he searches all the hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts, right? He understands all those things. He understands the intents and thoughts. And again, this is the realm which the Lord relates and speaks and comes to us, and that is the heart. Now, again, that's not the beating organ that's pumping blood around your body, you know, and getting to your brain. So, you know, maybe you're not getting too much of it right now and you're falling asleep or <laughs> you need to pump it up a little bit more or whatever. No, this is not that organ we're talking about. It's the inward person. It's the seed of our affection, who we are on the inside. And he said, listen, what the Lord desires from you and, and, and you know him in that relationship is if you just have a heart for him, if you have that, a loyal heart and a willing mind. And again, because he, he searches that, he knows that, that's the realm he moves in. And I guess we have to ask ourselves, what has our affections, 
uh, is it our own will? Is it our own plan? Is it what makes me happy? Is that what dictates my life? Uh, well, the Lord already knows those conditions and that intent, right? And David knew this well, and he understood this. And, you know, again, all that David had been through, uh, the Lord knew him and knew him well, and yet David knew the Lord still loved him. And it melts your heart to be loved unconditionally that way. He knows, and yet he still loves so Solomon, it all starts with your heart. It all starts on the inside. Just have a loyal heart to just always want to be in the center of his will, to just to love him and to know him and have that willing mind to do whatever he's called or leading and whatever he chooses this way or the other. Don't be, this is my plans. These are my affections. This is my will. And this, I'm working after what makes me happy and I'm trying to satisfy all those things and I give, you know, you know, got a place on Sunday for an hour, hour and a half maybe, and a little bit of time here and a little bit of there and whatever. Maybe some people like to compartmentalize, you know, their lives in that way. And then, well, but most of the time I'm, you know, tracking to my affection. David, though he made mistakes and sins, certainly, but at the end of the day, you know what? He was he had a loyal heart and a willing mind and wanted to love the Lord and realized the Lord knew him and knew all those mistakes and yet still loved him and uh, knew them all well. And his heart was just melted by the unconditional love that our Heavenly Father had towards him. And I would stand very clear on the fact that, you know, when people understand the unconditional love of our Heavenly Father, it has to impact a person's life. It has to. It has to because nobody loves you unconditionally. Now, now there's some things that come a little close and there's some mountaintops of that and there's some situations maybe in our lives we've experienced it here or there and this and that and maybe a little more in others and this and that. But generally on a whole, you know, all the other person is just not even in the race you know i do this you do this it's that, that whole kind of a thing and i'll love you if you love me i'll be nice to you if you're nice to me and all that goes but when somebody truly loves or understands to a, a degree that they can unconditional love that comes from a heavenly father i submit to you that it's a life changer and always is something good to witness um uh, Saturday, uh, there was a knock at the door and the usual Saturday morning knock. Now my back was really out, so I just didn't want to get up. And Ethan said, hey, dad, there's somebody at the door. And I said, well, who is it? I don't know. He's in a suit and a tie. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> right? You know who that is already, right? Not a young kid. He didn't say that, so it's not a Mormon. So it's got to be Jehovah Witness. And I said, oh, you know, Ethan, I usually don't like to miss those chances because they don't come very often. And how often do you get somebody coming to your door you get to witness to? And I kind of talked to him a little bit about that. But I think this is one of those great things to, to share with somebody like that. And instead of going down their well-worn path of things that they like to talk to you about, it's just talking about, do you, do you think that, do you think, and I try to use the word Jehovah so I don't offend them, but you know, do you know, do you think Jehovah loves you unconditionally? You know, does he love you? Um, do you think you experience that love no matter, you know, if you're doing good one day or if you went out witnessing one day or you missed a day or you didn't go to, um, I was going to say temple, what do they call it, uh, their church services or whatever. You know, these are great things to talk to them or other people about. You know, this, he, he does. He, he showed that unconditional love through Jesus Christ and we have to receive it. And when he do, you know, then we can share all the good news of what Jesus did on the cross and how he showed it through Jesus and what that really means to us. And, and I submit to you again, I think it's just life changing when people understand who our Heavenly Father is. Well, let's continue on. I said this is a short study, and boy, time flew by here. Verse 10, <laughs> Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Solomon, you got a job to do. Do it. Be strong. Trust the Lord. Do it. And I can't help but to think that's a word for some people listening today. Just do it. You already know. Just do it. Just do it. 
do it. And um, just do it. You heard it all? Just do it. Well, we'll pick this up. Let's read in verse 11 and kind of read over this because we'll talk about this next time. Verse 11 says, Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, for the house, for the treasuries, all the upper chambers, the inner chambers, the place of the mercy seat, the plans for all that he had by the Spirit, of the court of the courts of the house of the Lord, and all the chambers all around of all the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries of the dedicated thing, also the divisions of the priests and the Levites, for all the works of service of the house of the Lord, and for all the articles of service in the house of the Lord. He gave gold by weight for things of gold, and for all the articles to be used of every kind of service, also silver for the articles of silver by weight for all the articles used in every kind of service." The weight of the lampstands of gold and the gold and their lamps of gold by weight, each lampstand and its lamps for the lampstands of silver and weight and for the lampstands and its lamps according to each of the lampstand. And by the weight he gave gold for the tables of showbread for each table for the silver for the tables of silver, also pure gold for the forks, basins, pitchers of gold and the golden bowls. He gave gold by weight for every bowl and for the silver bowls, silver by weight for the every bowl, and refined gold by weight for, for the altar of incense and for the construction of the chariot, that is, the golden cherubim that spread their wings and overshadow the ark of the covenant of the Lord. All this, David said, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the works of these plans." And, and so we'll look at this a little bit close. I did pull up a, just a quick picture here because I just want to give you some sense. And I have a video I'll show you that somebody put together inside and outside the temple, which I think will, will help us to understand next time. But just notice that everything that can be gold is gold overlaid. The floor, the walls, the ceiling, everything. I mean, that's how much you know, was put into this and, you know, not accounting the gold lampstand and the tables and all those things. We'll talk about some of the gold next week because it weighs it out and actually tells you what it is. But David here, after talking to Solomon, I, I kind of picture it in our day and age because I've worked with plans for many years, but, you know, I imagine him, hand him a set of rolled up, you know, plans and hands them to Solomon. Here it is. This is how the buildings are. This is where the storage room is going to be. This is how the temple is going to look. These are all the instruments that you're going to need for, for all the offerings and the service of the Lord and all those things. Here, here, here it all is. And, uh, you know, the Lord gave me everything and, uh, and uh, gave me all the details of everything. And here it is laid out before you here that you might be encouraged to go out and do that. And not only that, it's, notice it says repeatedly there, David gave, David gave, David gave. He not only put all that together and, and, and the Lord inspired him and got everything and all the people and all the laborers and the land and all that stuff, but he also gave much towards its con con construction. And again, we'll talk about that next week. And, and we'll talk a little bit about verse 18, and I'll just leave this with a little food of thought here. And construction over the construction of the chariot, that is, the gold cherubim that spread their wings to overshadow the ark of the covenant of the Lord. I like that because he calls it the chariot, yet they're gold cherubim, but yet it's a chariot. We know what a chariot is, but we also know what the gold cherubim is. And so what's David saying here? And I can't help but to give you a little sneak preview of those imageries of God's throne we see in Ezekiel. So if you want to check out Ezekiel chapter 1, and I think it repeats it again in chapter, I can't remember off the top of my head. But anyway, it talks about a chariot. Kind of cool, but we'll talk about that as we look at it next week. But um, um, something interesting maybe you haven't thought of about that most holy place, or the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And then, let's finish up here in verse 20. And David said to Solomon, Be strong and of good courage. And do it. Do not fear or be dismayed, for the Lord uh, God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work of the service of the house of the Lord. Here are the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the service of the house of God, 
and every willing craftsman will be with you for all manner of workmanship, for every kind of service, also the leaders, and all the people will be completely at your command. And so he gives that encouragement to love the Lord and to know the Lord and to pass that along and have that relationship and it's, it's inside you. It's to have that heart and a willing mind to do that. And here are all the plans. Here's all the material. Here's all the workers. Everything you'll need, just do it. All you need to do is to do it. And again, I want to leave you with this thought. The Lord has done this for us too, hasn't he? We have everything we need to complete the work and to do his will in our lives that we're going to need. And what he hasn't given us, he will give to us when we need it. But he always gives us what we need to accomplish his will in our lives. And whether we possess it right now or whether when as soon as we need it, it'll be there. His promise is to do that. He, 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 he. He never asks us, never calls us to do anything that he hasn't prepared and equipped and will provide for us to do it. It just, it's just, it's not. He, he does that just as he's doing here with, if you can look at, you know, the, the lesser David and Solomon, our heavenly father does it with us, if you would. He has given us what we need when we, uh, and, and the ability to do it and what we need to do it to accomplish his will. And so the question I guess we have to ask ourselves is, what are we waiting for? Go for it. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for the great encouraging words tonight, Father, from this um, final words, uh, well, almost final words, Lord, of, of David to his son Solomon, and really to all the people as well, that they might be encouraged and be encouraged uh, and be encouragers by all this, Father, that they might all be drawn closer to you and see your work because they knew and understood what you've done in David's life. And so he, he wanted to make sure everybody else understood that as well. And, and Father, help us to be those people as well, and just to be sure of that. And if there's people listening or here tonight that just aren't sure what what your plan and calling is for the life, I pray that they would have a desire to want to make that clearly known. Uh, that they would desire to know and hear that from you. Father, that they could clearly state that and understand that, that they might be reminded in things day in and day out um, that, that they want to work towards that always, always having their ear open and their heart soft enough to hear and and to be faithful to what you say and do and work out in their lives, Lord. It becomes clearer and clearer and they get more and more encouraged and that in tune and that in turn, Lord, encourages others. It's just a wonderful, magnificent ripple effect from all that, Lord. And you want us to continue to do that to this day, Lord. Help us to be those people that know that, Father. Help us to be those people that go out and do it just as you've called and provided and instructed and equipped us to do, Lord. You're faithful to do that, Lord. We can take that to the bank for sure, Lord. We thank you for all that we have in Jesus and all that you've done through him, Lord, that love that you've shown us, that perfect love, unconditional love, Lord. May we continue to grow in that. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.